like to welcome everyone today. If you're a guest with us today, we're so glad to have you. If you're watching us online today, wherever you may be watching from, we welcome you as a part of this service. If you're not standing and you're able to stand, if you would, it's been such a privilege and an honor this weekend to have Brother Michael Enzi, who is first and foremost a man of God. Currently serving as our national youth president, but I I just kind of thought throughout the weekend, I realized that's what he's currently doing, but the bottom line is Brother Enzi is a great man of God. And Maryland has been blessed several times by his ministry and then actually our first uh, back-to-school revival under the leadership of the Mott and the youth team back then. Brother Enzi was our first back-to-school revival speaker. So this is its a pleasure to have him back with us. We've had a great weekend, and uh, we're excited that he can be with us in this service this morning. So, Brother Enzi, would you come take your liberty? We're so glad to have you at Antioch this weekend. Let's clap our hands to the Lord this morning. Come on, he deserves our praise today. He's a good God. He's a great God. He's a worthy God. Hallelujah. We magnify you, Jesus. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he which hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. The reason we're here today is because he's good. The reason we're here today is because his truth has endured. Hallelujah. Praise God. So good to be in his house today. So good to be in the presence of the Lord. There is absolutely no place that I would rather be than in his presence today, worshiping him with his people. It's a privilege to be at church this morning. Praise God. What an atmosphere of expectation today. I feel like there is faith in this house, believing that God has come to do something miraculous, to do something supernatural. The reason that the apostolic Pentecostal church is what it is, I believe, is because of equal significance that is placed upon spirit and truth it's not just all about spirit it's not just all about truth the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life but both are necessary it's the the wind and the word they are the elements of god's creative power and they're resident within this atmosphere today the word of God and the Spirit of God. It's what makes our church services powerful, where we have the Word and the Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. When you have the Word of God and the Spirit of God, it creates, it is an an atmosphere of creative power. I believe that, that God is here today to do something new in someone's life. I believe there, there's, a, there's a creative miracle that's available for somebody in this place today before we leave. Anybody believe that with me? In the name of Jesus, I claim that for somebody right now. I claim that in the name of Jesus for someone this morning who needs God to step into your world and do a creative work. God's able today. Praise God. 
It has been such a privilege to be here this weekend. I love coming to Maryland. Love coming to this church. What an incredible ministry team. I give honor to Pastor and Sister Wright. Love and appreciate them. I enjoy just the opportunity to fellowship with them. Give honor to Bishop and Sister Wright. What an incredible legacy of leadership, apostolic ministry. Brother and Sister Middleton and this great youth team, they're doing an awesome job leading a great group of young people. It's an exciting time to be a part of the church. God's doing some unprecedented things in the church today, and we get to be a part of that. And it's very, very exciting to see. It's a, an amazing time to be a part of the General Youth Division and see what is happening among this generation of young people. There, there's a hunger for God and just a desire to be engaged in the work of the kingdom that is within this generation like, like nothing I've really ever seen before. And it, it encourages me, it inspires me, it, in, it challenges me, uh, this current generation and their desire to be involved in the work of the kingdom. Uh, all it takes is just a moment at a North American Youth Congress like we had last year with over 19,000 that were there worshiping together to, to be inspired by this generation. And next year, we're going to be moving into a football stadium in Indianapolis with a capacity of 72,000 because the basketball arena wasn't big enough to hold everybody that wants to come. Talk about an atmosphere charged with faith. What's exciting to me is what's happening at that single event is not just confined to that single event. I, I believe it's just kind of a microcosm. It's a little peek into what's happening all across North America and around the world among the youth of the United Pentecostal Church who are responding to the Spirit of God and the call of God to be engaged in His kingdom. We're going to turn to John chapter number 6 today. While you're turning there, let me say how much I do appreciate your support of the General Youth Division, your support by engaging your students in district youth events, in national youth events, but also through your support in giving to Sheaves for Christ. Uh, Sheaves for Christ is the fundraising ministry of the General Youth Division. It supports everything that we do, uh, also supports so many missions efforts around the world. It's the only means through which our missionaries can obtain vehicles. So it is, it's critical to, to end time revival worldwide revival and so thank you for investing and giving into that great cause my wife also wanted me to just send her regards and regrets that she was not able to be with me this weekend she's actually speaking in oklahoma this weekend and so we were heading different directions our children are scattered throughout st louis at various homes today and uh thank god for my wife my family that god has blessed me with so thankful for them. John chapter number six, we're going to begin reading in verse number one. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Don't you hate that when God asks you a question? He already knows the answer. It's like, you know, you, you know. Thou knowest, like the prophet said when he was asked if those bones could live. You know the answer, God. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but... What are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he said to his disciples, told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Now, I may have made you a little nervous today when you saw the preacher bringing a sack lunch to the pulpit. Don't worry. I'm not going to preach that long, and I'll get you out of here in time for lunch. But I want to preach to you today from this subject, your miracle is in the bag. Your miracle 
is in the bag. God's got something. <laughs> God's got something prepared for somebody today. You, you didn't even know it when you woke up this morning. But I got good news for you. Your miracle is in the bag. God, God's been working on something. God, God's been working something. Maybe beneath the surface you didn't see it, you didn't realize it, you, you don't know how it's going to happen, but God's been working something and preparing something. Your miracle is in the bag today. I want you to, to pray with me right now that the Holy Ghost would help us and speak to us in the next few moments of this service. Would you pray with me in faith and expectation right now? In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your holy presence that is in this place. I thank you for your word that is alive. It is quick. It is powerful. Your word is able to discern the very thoughts and the intents of our heart. You know where we're living today and you know what we have need of. And I pray that your will would be accomplished in every family, in every life, that your will would be done in this church right now. You know every battle on every level that's taking place today. And I'm claiming victory. I'm declaring provision. I'm declaring your miraculous demonstration in the name of Jesus. Let it be done before we leave this service today. We claim it in the name of Jesus and we declare it. Would somebody just declare some things with your praise right now? Would you declare your faith with some praise right now? Oh, in the name of Jesus, come on. Go ahead and praise him with a little faith and expectation. I don't know what you need today, but God does. I don't know what this church needs, but God does. I don't know what you came today, the miracle that you need before you leave this service. But God knows, and God is able, and he's more than just able. He's willing. God's willing today in the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. There is a cliche. It's a, a figure of speech that we use here in America that means a particular positive outcome is certain. When something is said to be in the bag, whether we're talking about sports or politics or a business deal, when it's said to be in the bag, we are declaring that victory is assured. We are, we are considering the outcome to be a done deal. It is certain. It is in the bag. I, I've come to let somebody know this morning that your miracle provision is in the bag. If God has ever given you a promise, if he's ever spoken anything into your life, if he's ever spoken a promise into your spirit, maybe in an altar service somewhere, maybe late in a midnight hour prayer meeting someplace, in a desperate moment, if God's ever spoken something to you, if he's ever given you a promise, I let you know, I remind you this morning that your miracle is in the bag, that your promise is in the bag. It is a done deal. If God said it, it's going to happen. If God declared it, you can take it to the bank. It's in the bag. The writer of Hebrews said it this way in chapter 10, verse 35. Don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For ye have need of endurance or patience, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Don't throw away your confidence in God just because it doesn't happen the first time you pray. Don't throw away your confidence in God just because it doesn't happen next week, next month, next year. But hold on to your confidence. If God said it, when you have done the will of God, when you have been faithful, there's not a whole lot very exciting about faithfulness, but faithfulness equals effectiveness. And when you are faithful, God responds to faithfulness. So endure. Hold on with patience. And after you've done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. Your promise is in the bag. Now, this is an interesting story that we find in John chapter 6. There's so many elements of this story that I just find fascinating. I would love to have some super slow-mo video footage of the bread and the fish as it was being broken. I, I, I would love to know what was happening on the molecular level. 
as, as the bread and the fish was, was breaking and then beginning to grow back. I, we probably got some scientists, maybe somebody here today that could, could, could talk to us about the molecular uh, structure of bread and fish. I don't know what was happening. All I know is that as they begin to break that bread and to distribute, to distribute that, something supernatural began to happen. I, I wonder, how much do you think we could sell that kind of bread for today? I mean, just, just imagine. The, the guy goes home, he's like, babe, I got good news for you. I got some magic bread. You, we're never going to have to buy groceries again. This is awesome. I, I wonder, some of those people that took home the 12 basketfuls the next day, they were probably disappointed when they ate those 12 baskets and they didn't just multiply again. <laughs> what? What happened to the bread? I thought this was like gonna keep going on here. What's happening? It's, it's interesting to me that the hero of this story is one of the most unlikeliest of characters. The Bible says that there was a young boy there who had a lunch. One translation says he was just a lad. We don't know a whole lot more about him. We don't know exactly how old he was. We don't know where he is from. We don't know where his parents were. I mean, where was mom and dad that day? Maybe they were in the crowd, or maybe they just sent him on a long journey off, and all they gave him was lunch. But there's two key characteristics about this young boy that I want to point out today that made this story's miraculous provision possible. Now, you better put your seatbelt on, because this is going to be such deep revelation. It may knock you out of your seats. I want, I want you to be prepared. Are you, are you ready for this? Are you sure you can handle that? I mean, this, this, we're about to go deep, okay? I, I got two characteristics, the, the revelation that's going to blow your mind, that made this miraculous provision possible. Are you ready for number one? I, I don't know if you're ready. I, I don't know if you're ready for this. Are you sure you're ready for this? All right, number one, the reason that this miracle was possible is that this boy was present. I told you. I told you it was, it was going to be deep. I told you it, it was going to blow your minds. The Bible says that Andrew comes to Jesus and, and says, there is a boy who is here. The miracle was possible because the boy was present. You see, your, your miracle opportunity has one very important condition, must be present to win. You ever been a part of some kind of drawing, some, some kind of prize that's going out, and there's one very important condition. You must be present to win. You must be present to claim it. The first important condition that was resident that day is that the boy was simply there. He wasn't very old, but he's here. He's not very talented, but he's here. He doesn't have a whole lot to offer, but he's here. Maybe he doesn't have the greatest ability, but but he's here. I've discovered that the most important ability is availability. The most important requirement in experiencing a miracle is you got to be present. I got good news for somebody. You're already halfway to a miracle because you decided to show up on a Sunday morning at the Apostolic Church. You got to be present to get your miracle. You got to be present to get your promise. You got to be present. I got a feeling there's somebody probably here today that you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't have made it today. There were so many obstacles that stood in your way. You shouldn't be here. There's so many things that have happened in your life. You shouldn't be here, but you're here anyway. Maybe you don't even feel like being here today, but you came anyway. Maybe you had a bad week, but you came anyway. Maybe you feel like you don't have much to offer today. I don't have a whole lot of special abilities. All I have, in fact, are struggles and trials and tears and brokenness and challenges. All I feel like I got in my bag is some fear and doubt. I don't have a whole lot to, to offer God, but you're here anyway. I got good news. Your miracle is in the back. The second important characteristic is that he remembered lunch. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't normally forget lunch. Not too many times, Pastor, where I've gone through my day and it's like nine o'clock at night and it hits me, I forgot to eat today. 
I've never been that busy. I've never been that worried. I've never been that concerned about things. I, I, I don't know, I, maybe you have, have had that happen. I haven't had that happen. I don't forget lunch. So now you're thinking, all I gotta do to have a miracle is I gotta be present and I gotta remember lunch? Some of you are thinking about lunch right now. Man, I miss breakfast. All I had was coffee. I need some lunch. He was present and he remembered lunch. The, the key here is that he had something to give. He had something to offer. The writer of the gospel said it was just barley loaves. Now, commentaries tell us that barley loaves were the bread of the poor. It was inferior bread. Not only was it not enough bread to feed very many people, certainly not 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 20 or 25,000 people. Not only was it not enough to supply the need that day, it wasn't even very good bread. It was barley loaves. But as it turns out, he's the only one that remembered lunch. As it turns out, he's the only one at least that was willing to surrender his lunch. He was the only one who had something that he was willing to give. It may have been bad bread, but it was better than no bread. You may feel like you don't have a whole lot to offer today, but I promise you, offering something is always better than offering nothing. All I got is five loaves and two fishes. That's it. Yep, that's the ingredients for a miracle. I got good news for you. What you have in the bag today, it's the ingredients for God to do something miraculous. Now, now the good news today is that your miracle is in the bag. The bad news today is that your miracle is is in the bag. I'm going to say that one more time because it seems like that they didn't quite connect the way I was hoping that would. The good news today is that your miracle is in the bag. It is assured. It's certain because God is involved. But the, the problem, the bad news today is that your miracle is still in the bag. And as long as the ingredients for your miracle stay in the bag, the miracle will never become a reality. As long as those ingredients stay in your hands, the supernatural will never become possible. What, what are you holding on to right now that has within it the seeds of the supernatural? Well, what are you clinging to today that has resident within it the ingredients of, of a miracle today? Well, what is it that you're clinging to that has within it the makings of God's miraculous provision? I'm talking to somebody today who's holding on to some things that God's saying, come on, why don't you go ahead and put that into my hands. The bad news is that as long as you hold on to it, it will never be anything more than it is right now. You see, the little boy had just enough lunch to feed himself. And if he had consumed it within himself, perhaps it would have satisfied his, hung his own hunger, but no more. But when he surrendered that little insignificant lunch, into the hands of the master. Five inferior loaves of bread and two stinking pieces of fish was more than enough to feed 20,000 plus people with 12 baskets fulls that were left over. You see, your miracle is in the bag, but you got to get it out of the bag. You got to get it out of your hands and into the hands of the one who has all power and all ability. The challenge of the spirit today is a challenge of surrender to place all of yourself into the hands of the master. We are the clay. He is the potter. He's the one who's able to shape and to make and to do something. He can create something out of nothing. He can create order out of chaos. He can speak light into your darkness. But you got to place those ingredients, the makings of a miracle into the hands of the master. 
He wants your time. He wants your focus and your attention. He wants your worship and your devotion. He wants your talents and your abilities. He wants your finances, your, your abundance and your debt. We were talking a little bit about uh, SFC yesterday at a little minister's gathering. And, and one pastor said something about these are younger people. They don't have anything to give. They're in debt. I made the comment to somebody, you know, you can give your way out of debt. You can give your way out of debt when you invest in the kingdom of God. He wants control of every part of your life. He wants your past failures. He wants your present circumstances. He wants your future uncertainties. He wants your trials, your struggles, your brokenness. He wants all of you. He just wants you to put it in his hands. You see, it really, it really just comes down to trust and control. Because it's hard for us to trust, and we like control. I'm going to say that again. It, it, it's hard for us to trust. Why? Because we've been let down before. Others have disappointed us. Others have, have not followed through. Others have broken their promises, betrayed us. It's hard for us to trust. And we like control. We like to hold on to things. We like to give it to God in an altar and then pick it right back up and take it home with us. We like control. But you see, all of life is an investment. All of life is an investment. And my question to you today is this. Are you going to invest in your abilities or are you going to invest in his abilities? Because as long as you hold on to what's in the bag, you're investing into your own ability to do something about it. But the moment that you release it into the hands of God, you begin to invest in his ability to do something about it. All of life is an investment. Every decision is an investment. And that investment increases with compound interest. It was C.S. Lewis who said this in Mere Christianity. Good and evil both increase at compound interest. That's why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or a railway line or bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. You see, every decision that we make is an investment into our future. Every decision is placing into the hands of God the material the ingredients with which he is building our future. He can only work with the material that we give him. He can only work with the ingredients that we give him. Every time you bend your knee and surrender and pray, you're placing in the hands of God the ingredients for a miracle. Every time you start worshiping, even when you don't feel like it, even when you've had a bad day, even when you got a bad diagnosis, even when you lost your job, even when somebody walked out on you, the moment that you begin to worship God anyway, you're placing into his hands the ingredients, the makings of a miracle. We've been talking this weekend about Luke 9, 23, 24, 25. I've mentioned it several times. Jesus said, if you're, going to have to, if you're going to come after me, deny self. Take up your cross, follow me. But he goes on to say, for whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You see, all of life is an investment. And either way, you lose. Either way, you lose. The question is, how are you going to lose your life? How are you going to lose that situation? You can try to save it, and ultimately, you're going to lose it. Or you can lose it into the hands of the master. And ultimately, he's going to rescue you out of it. You see, all of life is an investment. You spend an hour in uh, hour praying or an hour playing, and the hour's gone. You can't get it back. But oh, the difference in the way that it is invested when you invest into the eternal when you lose your life to the eternal. You see, there, there are some things the Bible says that only come through prayer and fasting. Jesus said, this kind, 
cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. There are some things that only come through prayer and fasting. But I've discovered that not everything comes just through prayer and fasting. I'm not minimizing prayer and fasting. But it's not the will of God for you to pray 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And certainly not the will of God for you to fast 24-7, 365. At some point, you got to get up and do something. At some point, you got to leave the prayer room and activate your faith and go do something. At some, at some point, you, you got to leave the altar and go and do something with what you have committed at the altar. Not everything happens by prayer and fasting. There, there are some things that, that come through hard work. There are some things that come through preparation. There are some things that only come through faithfulness. There are some things that come through obedience. There are some things that only come through sowing. It's just the law of the harvest. You sow and you reap. There are some things that only come through sacrifice. I wonder what would have happened that day if that little lad had said, you know, Jesus, uh, I'm going to give you a tithe of my lunch. Let's see, we got five loaves, two fish, that's seven, so 0.7 of a piece of bread. I mean, we're very exact when we come to our giving. I mean, I got 0.7 of a piece of bread. You know what, God? I'm, I'll give you the whole loaf. We'll call the extra offering. We'll just call it even. We'll just give. I wonder what kind of miracle would have happened that day if he had just given part of his lunch. If he had just given a little bit. What? One pastor was, was preaching to his congregation about giving. He said, he said, don't give until it hurts. Give until it helps because your pain threshold is way too low. <laughs> what if the little boy that day said, you know what? I mean, I got to save some for myself, right? And had just given partial investment. I believe he would have received partial miracle but sacrificial investment of ourselves into the kingdom is not just giving a little bit out of abundance, but it's surrendering our all to God. Jesus said one day against the treasury, the Bible says he was watching people who were giving and investing. Some gave out of their abundance, but one little lady gave her all. He, he said she has given more than anybody else because God doesn't judge our giving and our sacrifice by how much is, by how much is given. He judges it by how much is left over after we've given. That's how God judges it, sacrifice. And there are some things that only come through sacrifice. It's just a principle of the kingdom. It's the law of the harvest. It's sowing and reaping. It's giving. In the same measure that we meet out, it's going to be measured back to us. It was Gandhi who said this, the roots of our problems are wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, politics without principles, commerce without morality, science without humanity, and worship without sacrifice. Worship without sacrifice. There are some things that only come through sacrifice. And sacrificial investment into the kingdom of God opens a door to supernatural demonstration. It opens a door to miraculous provision. God said, try me and see. If you invest into my kingdom, I'm going to open the doors of heaven and I'm going to pour out a blessing that you can't even contain. I'm not just talking about finances today. I'm talking about us trusting him enough and relinquishing control of the things that he's given us, whether it's finances or ability or talent or even the struggles and the difficulties that we're dealing with and placing them in the hands of God, trusting him and relinquishing that control. Abraham and Isaac made that journey that day to the top of the mountain. Abraham said, we're going to worship. He didn't tell the servants he was going to sacrifice his son, but he said, we're going to worship. And when they got to the top of that mountain that day, it was a beautiful demonstration of worship where we had obedience and submission. You see, for for Abraham, it was obedience to the command of God. But Isaac, commentators will tell us that Isaac was an adult. He may have been as old as 30 years of age that day. He was not a little child that Abraham was placing on that altar. He was a grown man. It, It was just as much his decision that day as it was his father's what took place on that mountain. It was an act of submission for Isaac. I can imagine him climbing up on that altar himself. He's climbing up on that altar saying, okay, dad, if you're saying this is, this is what it's going to take in order for the promise to come to pass, then I'm willing to do it. And as Isaac climbs up on the altar that day, unbeknownst to, to dad and son, years before a ram had been born, 
that God was already preparing. Imagine that ram climbing up the backside of that mountain maybe days or weeks in advance and, and God was already providing. God was already making a way, miraculous provision because of sacrificial investment that was made on top of the mountain that day. We have obedience and, and we have submission and we have God making a way and providing because Abraham said, I'm willing to give all. It doesn't make any sense to me. How can give, giving everything away provide for the needs that I have? But God God miraculously provided that day on top of the mountain because of sacrificial investment. A few weeks ago, I was, I was preaching Sunday night service, and while I'm still preaching, there was a man about halfway back on the left side. I hadn't given the altar call. I hadn't given anybody permission to respond yet. But this man about halfway back on the left side he had had a stroke about six months before. Left side was affected. Left eye was closed. He couldn't open his left eye. When he did, just force his eye open, his vision was completely blur blurred, could not see anything out of that eye. While he's back here about halfway back on the left side, I'm preaching away. I'm trying to, you know, get to important points in my message. And he just starts worshiping. He's just making a little investment. Just a sacrifice of praise. He's worth while he's worshiping. Nobody laid their hands on him. Nobody spoke anything. He's just worshiping. And all of a sudden, his eye begins to twitch a little bit <laughs> and opens up. And he can see. <laughs> His eye is open. The blurriness is gone. And he can see why. Because he just started worshiping. He just put it in the hands of God. Said, God, I I'm just going to give you my praise anyway. I I'm just going to go ahead and sacrifice and, and just see what God does. And he wasn't even asking God for a miracle. He was just worshiping. And God showed up. A miraculous provision comes through sacrificial worship. Through sacrificial investment. A couple of years ago, my, my dad's church in Texas, they were, they were given a push for Sheaves for Christ, and people just started responding, just amazing, just, just sacrificial giving and, and investment. One particular couple who was struggling financially, they made a pledge that day, said, we're giving this in the offering. They gave the offering, didn't even have it to give. The next day, Monday, they go to the mailbox, and they pull out an envelope from their mortgage company, probably expecting another bill, Right? They open up the envelope, and there's a check inside. Now, how many know that mortgage companies don't send us money? I've never had my mortgage company send me money. They have asked me for a lot of money. There's a check. They said, five years ago, you double paid your taxes, and somebody was doing an audit of your account and realized what had happened. So we've sent you a check that just happened to be just over the amount that they had pledged on that Sunday to give in that offering. So we just, we just were doing an audit of the account and before they made the pledge the previous week, God had already put it in the mail. He had prepared it five years earlier. When they didn't even realize it, he had already made miraculous provision available for them. I'm talking about a God who responds to sacrificial investment. In that same offering in my dad's church two years ago, there was a businessman who started giving. He got a little bit carried away. He gave $9,000 that day. And after service, it kind of hit him. Whoa, wait a second, what did I do? He came to himself. Uh, I don't have $9,000 to give. He realized he's gonna have to take a draw from his company just to pay the pledge that he made. But that very next week, one of his clients calls him and says, we need to pay, we need to pay up on the the outstanding invoices that we have. They said, we don't have any outstanding invoices. You are paid in full. They said, no, something's wrong, something's missing. That, that doesn't make any sense. There's this work that you did for us. And they said, well, well, we didn't bill you for that because it wasn't in the contract, but we ended up having to do that to complete the job. So we just went ahead and we just absorbed the losses. They said, no way. You're too important of a client to us. You need to bill us for that time. Now, how many know that's not normal? You don't have clients who call you and want to pay you for things you don't bill them for. They want to call and argue about the things you did bill them for. 
They added it all up all the time, put together invoices, sent it to them. You know what the invoices equaled? $90,000. Ten times the amount that he had just pledged on that Sunday, that the very next week, God said, you know what? You invested in my kingdom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up. I'm going to make a way. I don't know what you have need of today. Pastor, I don't know what this church has need of financially or otherwise, but I know a God who has all the resources. He has all the ability in heaven and in earth. And when we sacrifice into his kingdom when we give when we invest it's just a law of the harvest God God is gonna come through God's gonna make a way when you place into his hands the ingredients the makings of a miracle I want our musicians, I want our musicians to come second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 says this Whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully, reaps bountifully. You want partial blessing? You want partial miracle? You want partial provision? Just give a little bit of yourself. See, you will sow. The question is, into what will you sow those seeds of potential? Into what? Will you sow the seeds of your potential? Are you going to sow into your faith or are you going to sow into fear? You, you, you're going to sow into the, the pain of your past or are you going to sow into the hope of a future that God's preparing for you? What, what, what are you going to sow those seeds of potential? See, Jesus said... Speaking of this law of the harvest, said in John chapter 12, verse 24, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. As long as you hold on to that seed, it will never be anything more than what you can make out of it. It will never be anything more than what it is. But the moment you release that seed and you sow into the soil of faith, there is exponential potential that can come forth from that single seed. We can count how many seeds are in an apple. We can't know how many apples are in a seed. Only God knows. And as long as we hold on to that seed of potential, It'll never be anything more than what it is, what it's been. But the moment you release it, that soil of faith, the moment you begin to trust and relinquish control, you release into the hands of God the makings of a miracle. I want you to stand with me today. Into what are you going to invest yourself? Into what are you going to invest your time, your talents, your abilities? Into what are you going to invest the challenges, the struggles, the trials? What are you going to do with that diagnosis from the doctor? Are you going to hold on to it? Are you going to release it into the hands of the master? What, what, are, what are you going to do with that family situation that you're dealing with right now? Are you going to hold on to it? Are you going to try to control it? Are you going to try to ma ma manipulate the situation to try to make something out of it yourself? Are you going to sow into your ability? Or are you going to sow into his ability? Paul told the Galatians, don't, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So don't grow weary of doing good. Don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I want you to close your eyes all over this sanctuary right now. God's talking to somebody right now about relinquishing that control, about trusting Him, about placing into His hands 
the makings of a miracle today. See ingredients of an increase. <laughs> what are you clinging to right now? What are you holding on to? What's God speaking into your spirit right now that He wants you to release? <laughs> There's a creative miracle that's available for somebody's family. There's a creative miracle available in somebody's life. What are you going to do with those seeds of potential? Are you going to hold on to it or are you going to release it? The good news today is your miracle's in the bag. But the bad news is it's still in the bag. What are you going to do with it? The challenge of the Spirit to, to someone today is release it in the hands of, of the one who can do something about it. This altar's already open. The opportunity is available for somebody that just wants to step out today and say, God, I trust you. God, I'm going to put into your hands. I'm going to sow into the seed, into the soil of faith, of those seeds of potential. I'm not going to hold on to it anymore. Come on, if the Holy Ghost is speaking to you right now, if at any point in this message, the Spirit of God has pricked your heart, I open these altars and invite you to come down, to step into this altar, whatever it is that you're holding to today, whatever it is that you're clinging to right now, if you just come down and release it into His hands. Come on, put it in the hands of God. I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to surrender to your hands today, God. I don't know what your family needs today. I don't know what you may need in your personal life today. But God has the ability to provide in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I declare it. In the name of Jesus, it's done. In the name of Jesus, it's done. Oh, yes. Oh, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all. If you have need of a physical healing today, I invite you to step down in this altar and just lift your hands in worship and receive your miracle. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, you can experience that today before we leave this service. All you have to do is just surrender to Him in worship. Someone today is battling and dealing with some financial struggles and difficulties. I invite you to step into this altar and surrender in the hands of God. God, I'm going to trust you. I've tried to do it on my own, but I can't do it. I've tried to make something out of it on my own, but I can't handle it. I'm going to put it in your hands. There's someone today who's dealing with some family issues and struggles. There's some relationship issues that you're dealing with. I encourage you to place it in the hands of God. Say, God, we've tried to handle this on our own, but we can't do it. I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm going to surrender to your hands today. In the name of Jesus. He had a There's some, some couples here today. There's some husbands and wives, some, 
some couples right now that you just need to walk down this altar get a hold of each other by the hand and walk down into this altar and just believe God some for some miracles that need to happen in your family could we just do that as a church body today just begin to gather together down in this altar area because we just make our way right now as a church family there's some needs that this church body has that I believe God is going to provide that God's going to make a way why don't we just begin together as a church family right now and make our way together into this altar area and believe God God's going to provide the needs for the apostolic church God's going to provide the need of your family in the name of Jesus she had the yeah I see Oh, yes, I trust you, God. I relinquish control into your hands, God. Oh, yes, I surrender. Oh, I surrender all to you. I put it in your hands. Oh, I surrender. I surrender all. All to Jesus. surrender oh I surrender oh yes I surrender I surrender all oh yes I I surrender all 